Hello, how's everyone doing today? Hope you guys are enjoying uh, Unite. Um, this is a topic on ECS. We love performance, um, or how we at TikTok Games use ECS in our mobile puzzle games. Um, this is a, um, I'm a programmer, a lead programmer at TikTok Games. Let me just talk about myself here first for a minute. Um, I've worked on games such as Adventures of Pip, which we've put on the Wii U, we have on the PSN, Xbox Live. Um, also was lead programmer for Smurfs Bubble Story, which is um, available on iOS and Android, has millions of downloads. I also have a picture of our team at TikTok Games from a couple years ago. Um, Halloween is coming up. I hope you guys have uh, your costumes ready. So recently, um, we started working on a new kind of puzzle game. Um, we've done some bubble shooters in the past, like Bust a Move or Match Three Bubbles, and we wanted to make a um, block-based puzzle game. Um, you've seen, I'm sure you've played these. There's a swipe match three, which is really common. Um, there's also a tap to match two. Um, this, is, this is an image of our tap to match two game. Um, so when we started work on this, um, we had the opportunity to start using ECS. Um, I had actually used ECS in, um, on my own um, for fun. Um, I've had some exposure to it. Um, and then so Unity came out with their own uh, enti entities library. And we decided to go ahead and uh, give it a shot. Um, so that's what this talk is about. A little bit about our experience um, using ECS. Um, just want to clarify, we're only using ECS for the block gameplay. We're not using it for the rest of the game. We don't use ECS for our stores or anything like that. But um, I thought it worked pretty well for what we were using it for. Um, we're separating the data from the visuals. So uh, you might have seen some talk about pure ECS versus hybrid ECS. We are definitely a hybrid ECS. Um, we don't do any of our visuals um, in ECS. We do all the data, and then the visuals just kind of reflect uh, the data that is found inside the ECS. So um, one question I realize people have a lot is, what exactly is ECS? It stands for Entity Component System. Um, See, I'm going to start with components. What are components? They're pretty much just pieces of data. Um, some examples here, you have your velocity, you have health, world position. These are, I think, are very common pieces of data. Um, sometimes a piece of data can literally just be a component um, if it exists or not, um, such as a broken component. Uh, we have an ignore gravity component, which will take one of our blocks and make it so it no longer falls. Um, we also have very common components like already processed or modified. Um, this lets us know when we've worked on something or if we need to work on something. So um, that's something we, we do a lot is just kind of tag an entity uh, with a component. Um, there's also systems. Systems is the opposite of data. It's just code. There shouldn't be any data in systems. They, they act upon the, the data. Um, some features we've broken down into multiple systems. You can see um, we have like a gravity target. It's really a gravity prediction system. We have a add gravity system and a gravity system. So we kind of split that up into three systems. Um, the whole idea with systems is you really want to take a few kinds of data, a few pieces of data, and just work on those pieces of data together. So we have the components, we have the systems. Um, oh, I do want to talk about a little bit about what goes on in a game. So. Way, one way to think of a game is when we're playing through a game, we want to get 60 frames a second. Um, so what we do is we have some kind of data. The game is in some kind of state. You have a certain number of lives, a certain amount of time on a clock. Um, this is also the color of each pixel on the screen. So we have this data, and we kind of have a snapshot of it, and we display that snapshot to the player. Um, we then take input. We process the input, process the data again, and then Hopefully, 16 milliseconds later, um, we have another snapshot of the data where we have to take all the data and make a visual representation of that and show it to the player. Um, so, so I kind of like this separation of data where we're dis displaying the data in a visual way, and then we act on the data. Um, we have systems that act on the data. Um, I do want to talk about entities. Uh, this is actually kind of a, a bad way of thinking about entities, but if you're um, new to ECS, and you're used to object-oriented programming, this might make a little more sense. Um, it's kind of like a bag of components. It's actually not a great way of, of thinking about it, but uh, well, the important thing here is what components are attached to your entity is, is what determines what that entity is. So um, for example, if I have something with a world position and it has a gravity component on it, then I know it's, it's a falling thing because it has that kind of data on it. Um, we also have like a board component, 
literally only, all it has is the size of the board. Um, we might have something with health, which means you can hit it multiple times before that block breaks. Um, it might have an ignore gravity component on it, which means it's never gonna fall. Um, it has a board position and world position. So, so entities um, are kind of how you, you can associate your pieces of data together into uh, um, one thing that we think of. Um, so the question is, is why do we use ECS? Um, the main reason to use ECS is performance. Um, I personally enjoy uh, separating data from the code. I think it, it makes a lot of sense to do that um, just in general. But ECS really kind of codifies it. Um, it make, makes us like a design pattern out of it and almost forces you to, to think about your data separately from your code. So one of the things, um, CPU speeds have gone up. I know when I was growing up, uh, there's a lot of talk about Moore's Law. Maybe not so much now. Um, the reason for this is, uh, I mean, we used to have megahertz and went up to gigahertz, and, and your CPU speed was going faster and faster and faster. Um, one of the speeds that hasn't been increasing nearly as fast is the speed of, of reading data out of your, your RAM. So what's kind of happened here is it's become very cheap. It's very quick to process on data, um, but accessing the data is, is turning into where that, that bottleneck is. So what can we do about this? Um, one of the things to know is if you're programming and you're trying to really get performance, it, it's really kind of important to know how the CPU or how your computer is going to be accessing the data. Um, generally, when we, when we work in object-oriented programming, um, I have an example here. I play a lot of RPGs. So you have an orc or some kind of enemy that you want to fight. This enemy might have a position. It might have a rotation. Has, uh, maybe it has an AI manager attached to it. A lot of times, these are, are stored as reference, reference types as well. So what ends up happening is you have, you have your orc, and it contains some things. Um, probably contains references to other objects in RAM. So, so you need to go, go kind of search through your RAM um, to find all the data you need before you can even process on it. So, so if you remember the previous slide, this graph right here, um, you can kind of see that, that this is not really ideal for what we want. Um, it's going to slow us down. The actual processing of the data, the working on the CPU, might be very quick. But um, if we can't get the data very fast, then the CPU is going to have to wait. So one of the, the results of this is, um, well, we're going to try to line up our data in a row. Um, so we have two goals. We want to keep our data um, tightly packed in RAM. Um, we avoid reference types. If we use a lot of reference types, what ends up happening is, is you allocate memory here, you allocate memory out here, and then whenever you need to access that memory again, um, you have to load it. And what happens is the CPU, it, it, it's so expensive to go get, get stuff from RAM that when it goes and fetches things from RAM, it's going to try to guess and prefetch. Um, it'll generally pick you know, the next few bytes or whatever um, and automatically grab those and put them into the CPU cache so it's ready to go. And an object-oriented, um, when you program using object-oriented, that, that might not be helpful. I mean, it's probably what you want, but a lot of times you end up having to go back to RAM some other place in, in RAM to get the data you need, um, and it's not ready for you. So, so what we try to do is we try to line up all our data in a row. Um, you can see here, if we take all our positions for all our orcs, all our NPCs, for everything in the game, um, we'll take all the positions and line them up. Um, this is a little bit different than when we work with object-oriented programming. And object-oriented, a lot of times, we think of the object, we think of the orc, we think of uh, the car, um, and all the pieces to the orc, all the pieces to the car. But um, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to kind of separate out the position from everything and take the positions and line them all up. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the velocities. And what this allows us to do is when we want to update the position of everything, um, we can do it for everything in the game at once. Um, normally, when I think of object-oriented programming or how I did this in the past is I might have an enemy manager, which had a reference to all the different enemies. And every update loop, I would go to the first door first orc and have the orc do everything it wanted to do. It would run its AI, it would update its animations, um, it would may, maybe might attack, change its inventory, something like that. Um, and then once we finished everything with that orc, we would move to the next NPC and do everything for that. And then once we finished all the enemies, we might process what the player was doing. So this, this is kind of different. We're kind of um, taking out pieces of data, the same, same kinds of data from everything. 
um, almost like shredding, shredding apart the orc. And instead, we have all these positions, we have all these velocities. What that allows us to do is we can process things in batch, um, just go through them in, in a line. Um, arrays are, are fast. Um, I know when I, I was programming, I kind of used dictionaries a lot, hash sets a lot. I was told that these things are fast um, data structures. You can look things up very fast. Um, one thing I found, though, is that that's not necessarily the truth. Um, this is a very ideal for ECS setup, right? What we have here is we have a comparison between reference types, a class. Um, that float reference, um, when I programmed it, actually has a boxed float inside of it, another reference type. Um, and I just want to go through and increment all these floats by one. I have a million of them, right? And I did the same thing um, using a float component, which is a struct type, which means um, we know the size of the struct. So when I you know, reserve space for one million of these structs, we can literally do it all in a row in RAM, um, which makes it very, very fast to iterate through. And you can see here there's a huge difference. Um, Again, this is an ideal setup for ECS, but incrementing 1 million floats um, took us 3.59 milliseconds with the arrays. With the references um, on my computer, I ran this a bunch of times, it was about 118 milliseconds. Now, um, you might have seen some demos where people are showing off ECS, like a Boyd's demo, and usually in these demos, they're running like hundreds of thousands of things on the screen at a time. Um, the reason why they, they pick these as ECS demos is because you just can't do it with reference types. I mean, we have 16 milliseconds to run 60 frames a second, and if I have a million things, I have to search for a million references in RAM, it's just not gonna happen. Um, you can do it with ECS, but, but with reference types, uh, you're gonna have a, probably a lot more, lot more problems. It's just not possible. So um, there are definitely some things that are faster with a hash set. I mean, seeing if something exists, um, or contains, is contained in a collection. I mean, that's what a hash set is really made for, right? Um, whereas, like, if I have an array, I have to kind of loop through the array until I find the thing I'm looking, looking for. Sometimes I might be lucky, and it happens on the very first, very first element I find what I'm looking for. Sometimes I might have to go through all the way to the hundredth element or the millionth element. So um, you can see here that the hash set is definitely faster. Um, the point of this slide is, is kind of, when I first started working with ECS, I thought, you know, I heard this performance by default, and the idea was, if I just switch to ECS and I use this ECS library, that my game will be faster, and that's not necessarily the case. What we found is that um, sometimes you, you do, need, well, you definitely need to keep in mind what's going on with your RAM, um, but sometimes we actually had to change our algorithms. Um, let's see, so I wanna talk about Entities aren't actually bags of data. I kind of said how this was a bad way of thinking about it, a more accurate way of thinking about it, and if you know what your computer is doing, um, you'll be able to program so that the computer can process your data faster. So really, we have an array of all our world positions, an array of all our health components. Um, we may have some bomb blocks that blow up in our games as well. Um, and an entity is really kind of, uh, um, it tells us which of these components, which component in the array, um, which index in the world position components is associated with this entity. And so we can kind of take these different components and, and group them together um, into an, an entity, into an orc if you'd like, but really the idea here is we want to do whatever can, we can process through RAM faster and align. Um, thinking of it as an orc entity is helpful to us as a human. But sometimes, um, you know, it might, might be faster not to think of it that way. So I'm gonna run through a quick example here. Um, one thing as I was running through this example, I kind of realized that maybe, maybe I can uh, improve this some more um, when I get back to work. So, so one of the things um, when I was learning ECS and I was going online, it's a very new library, so sometimes there weren't um, some complicated examples. Most of the examples I saw were very, uh, very simple examples, like you know, using a velocity to modify a position. Um, so one, one of the things we ran into is, is we need to know, you know, we have these four blocks, four red blocks on the lower left here. We need to know which blocks are connected together as the same color, because um, when you tap, when you tap to match, it's gonna break all the, all the red blocks that are connected, right? Um, so this is an algorithm that we had. We had run this on our old way. I'm just gonna run through the algorithm really quick. 
So we have um, our assigned group, things in our group. We start in the origin. Um, we mark it as we visited this block. Um, and we also want to, this is a block that we need to check. Um, this block gets put into a group. And we look at its neighbors, right? Its neighbors, um, we have a, a green block and a red block. The green block doesn't match the color, obviously. So we've checked it, marked it as visited. Move on to the next block, which does match the color. So we're actually going to say that we need to check this block now. Um, this is actually the first loop through this algorithm, um, finding all the connected colors together. And then we go on to the next loop. Um, we have this block that says we need to check it at 1, 0. So we're going to look at that block. We're going to add it to the group. And again, we're going to look at its neighbors. Um, the first block we skip because we've already visited it. The next block is the correct color. So we need to mark it that we want to check its neighbors as well. This is like a recursive function. Um, next block as well. And we're done with the second loop. Now, um, I'm just going to click through here pretty quickly. And you can see we can continue on. These blocks have already been checked. These blocks don't match. Um, and we got one block left. And you can see our recursive function is going to end at this point. So we found our first group. Now, one of the, um, this is a pretty common thing. This is a, a hefty, uh, this is a slow, slow function that we had to run in our game originally. And um, one of the problems, though, we came is we, we would end up with these lists of lists, lists of positions um, that signify the different groups. Now, on ECS, there's a problem with collections that change size. And the problem with that is if you have, say you have three lists, or 10 elements each, and they, they're all lined up in RAM, as soon as you need to increase the size of the middle one, it doesn't fit anymore, which means we need to move it outside. And it kind of breaks this whole have our data in a row in RAM that we can just kind of process and run through. Um, so we kind of had to figure out, well, this was our algorithm, but how do we make this more ECS friendly? Um, and our answer to that was actually we, we stopped using lists. Let me, let me load another scene here. So instead of using lists, what we did is we, we would tag blocks with pieces of data instead. So in this case, we would start in the bottom left. And instead of using a list, oh, it looks like this is not working right now. OK. Apologize for that. But um, so instead of using lists, what we would end up doing is we would, we would process on the first block. We would mark it as part of group one. And then we would mark it if we, we checked and it didn't fit group one. Um, and we were able to run through the same, same kind of algorithm. Um, but, but we didn't need any kind of lists. And at the end, we realized, you know, all we need to do is we just need to mark blocks with IDs of what group they're in. We don't actually need to have this resizable list um, for all the different groups in the game. And th this actually made it so later on, when we wanted to act on these groups, we could, we could do it very easily. We would just say, give us the group with ID 1, or give us the group with ID 2. Um, and then we would already have all the blocks that we needed right there. Um, we almost use it as like a filter to filter out the entities that we wanted. Um, in order to do this, we, we, we also use a native array internally. Um, we take all the blocks and take their 2D position, and we convert it to um, a one-dimensional index in the native array. And that way, we can do a direct lookup of the blocks. Um, previously, we were using a dictionary where we had positions as the keys and then a reference to the block as the values, um, which ended up being um, quite a bit slower searching for everything. Now, this, this isn't exactly a, a perfect ECS um, scenario, but I, I just wanted to bring it up because it was something that we ran into. Um, again, we found a lot, you know, adding, adding velocity to a position was something that we found a lot of examples of. But, but something, this is a little bit more complicated, so I just wanted to bring it up um, as, as something we had to deal with. So, I'm sure if you work with ECS in your, own, in your own games, you'll come across the same thing. We're so used to these resizable, resizable containers. Um, I, I do believe there is a, a resizable buffer now that's available for ECS. But um, we've kind of gotten used to just, just tagging things as, as a technique. Um, you can see we have, a, we have a two different algorithms here. Um, it got sped up. Another thing, that, another benefit that we have from this is um, we got rid of any nested loops that we had. 
We got rid of all the contains, calls to contains. Um, we used to use contains to see if we've already visited, already checked on a block. Um, we also had a problem when we first did this that instead of uh, when we were using contains, we were using contains on arrays after we switched everything to arrays, which meant we were doing this nested loop where we were searching through the entire array trying to find a certain block. That completely blew up um, the amount of time it took to do this block grouping. So, so one of the lessons we learned from that is if you're, if you're doing nested for loops trying to find a specific entity, that's kind of a bad ECS smell to me. Um, there's probably some way you can change your algorithm to just tag, tag an entity um, or something along those lines. Pre-process if you need to. Uh, this was another thing. We had a dictionary. Um, position is as keys. References to the blocks as its values. Um, so what we found is it's very, very quickly. We can just iterate through all the blocks once kind of assign them to this one dimensional native array that we had, um, and that would make the rest of the calculations much faster. We no longer had to rely on the dictionary at that point. Yeah. One of the side benefits um, of ECS, once, we, once you, you know, start getting used to programming so all your data is in a row in RAM, I really want to keep that in mind, um, as we found it, that it, it made multi-threading a lot easier. Um, if you remember that graph I had earlier about CPU speeds increasing, but the RAM speeds weren't increasing, well, in the last few years, CPU single core speeds haven't been increasing either. They've kind of uh, stalled out. So what we do instead is we add more cores. We add more cores to the CPU. Um, I remember if, if you had bad performance in a game, you could just wait a couple of years, and, and maybe what was bad performance was now good performance. But we can't rely on that anymore. You wait a couple of years, and your single core is probably not going to be much faster. So I think um, learning multi-threading is something that, that we as an industry are going to learn, have to learn how to do. Um, you can see I have the word easy multi-threading here. I never thought of multi-threading as easy before. Um, if, if any of you have done multi-threaded code, it's, it's very, very different than um, code that just runs you know, in a, on a single thread. Um, I mean, you have thread locks, context switching, your data can change mid-function. I mean, I mean, that alone is very, very significantly different than, than just programming uh, in a, where all your, your function is running in a row. Um, so, so Unity actually kind of, kind of helps solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, individual core speed is no longer increasing. Uni ECS kind of enables us to, to kind of hit a lot more of the cores. Um, when, I, when I first did multi-threading, what I would do is take a complicated, very complicated computation, and I kind of spooled it off into a worker thread, and then some frames later I could get the answer back, right? And then, and then that, we'd stop using that extra thread until next time we had to do a complicated, um, complicated computation. The way that Unity has set up their ECS system, though, is that once you have everything running on component systems, when if you convert them to job component systems, you almost get 100% usage of all the cores um, just from that change. Um, you still have to deal with, with some timing things. I mean, you, you do have multiple, multiple things that can change your data, but um, it, it's definitely a lot, much smaller step than it was previously. So, so again, one of the biggest benefits of ECS is that once you have everything in component systems, you can convert it to jobs and offload that work onto a, a worker thread quite easily. I, I was really impressed by how, how Unity did that. Um, so here's, here's an example of the very simple system that I've used. This is a uh, velocity system um, that we've used in our games. Um, you can see we just take, take world positions, everything with the world position, everything with a velocity component, and we add the velocity to the position um, we don't care what these things are. In fact, we can use this in multiple games. We, this doesn't even have to be a puzzle game that we can use the system in, and it would work just fine. Um, you can see here, we've converted it to a job. Um, this is literally the same class. I mean, we can, we can just change the code, and it works with the rest of our game just fine. We didn't have to make any other changes to the rest of our game. And now, this entire system runs on a second thread. If you haven't seen the new profiler, it's pretty amazing. Um, it'll actually kind of show a graph 
of, of where your time is being spent and what class and in what systems. Um, if you have worker threads going, it'll show each of your cores on your CPU and what, what jobs are running on those threads. Um, this is really useful when you're trying to figure out why one system is waiting for another system. Um, or if you have data changing in the middle of one system running, you can kind of see what, what is happening, what order these systems are running, when they're running during a frame, and maybe where you can uh, save some time. So remember that thing where we were incrementing one million floats? I mean, I, I almost had to check this, um, uh, make sure I didn't have a bug in, in my code. But we had 118 milliseconds, which is much too long. We can't, a, a single frame at 60 frames a second is 16 milliseconds. Um, we also had the, is it 3.59, 3.6 milliseconds to iterate through a million of them as structs. Um, I offloaded it to cores, and you can see it, it jumped down to 0.37 milliseconds because we're running, we can do it eight times as fast or however many cores are on your CPU. I mean, there's something called um, burst compilation, which I really haven't had too much time to play with, but uh, it makes some assumptions about what you're doing with your for loops or, or how you're processing your data. And because of that, they can kind of cut out some of the extra work that your CPU is doing. Um, and I mean, 0.01 mil, there's not even any blue on that graph there. Like, yeah, I, I had to check that and make sure. This is, um, that's with all the safety checks and all that turned off. It just goes fast. One of the benefits we had with this as well was um, we were able to go through some faster design iteration. Um, I don't know, one of the problems, I'm not going to say it's a problem, one of the challenges working you know, in this creative field is we have designers, they're not programmers, right? So sometimes they can't think about um, how a computer works. So a lot of times, you know, they come to, to tech with the design and we kind of have to explain to them what's easy, what's hard, um, and so on. One thing that's very easy in ECS is just adding a component to something. Um, once we have a system, we can reuse it. Um, the systems aren't integrated with each other nearly as much, so we can change one part of the game without touching a lot of the other game. Um, there's not a lot of adapters or connective tissue. I know there's times where um, if I had an a enemy class, I would have to derive an orc class from it, and the orc has slightly different code than, say, um, a dragon class, or something along those lines. But with ECS, you don't, you don't have, the code's not changing. You're just adding a component, adding a piece of data that makes it a dragon or makes it an orc. Um, so I found that, that kept some of our code a lot cleaner. So here's an example, again, from our, our puzzle games. Um, one of the things we wrote is we wrote an attribute called a blockability attribute. You can see here we just attach it to whatever component. We have a block database where our game designers, they can kind of build new blocks that do different things in our puzzle game. So ignore gravity. That will prevent a block from falling down. Um, just by adding this, this blockability attribute to it, it makes it appear in a drop-down menu on a scriptable object or block database. Our game designers they can kind of just kind of pick and choose, like what kind of, what kind of things do I want this block to do? Um, if it has a health value, a place will appear where they can type in the, the health value, give it initial values. And um, I thought this was really cool, because once they saw this, and they, they kind of understood what we're doing, what we're doing with ECS. It's like we have these systems, and, and you can literally change what an entity is by adding or removing a component from it. Um, I also think it gives them some ideas. They can kind of see the different components and be like, what happens if I try to mix these two components together? What kind of block am I going to get? And we don't even have to do anything. So they can just kind of deal with this drop down, set some initial values, and they can, they can test new obstacles without any kind of programming or coding needed at all. And um, I thought that was really cool. Um, another thing is, Unit tests, um, I'm a huge fan of unit tests. We're trying to get better about doing them in our studio at TikTok Games. Um, I did find um, some examples of unit tests were a little bit hard to find until uh, when you download the entities package, there is a unity.entities.test namespace. It has all the tests, unit tests from Unity themselves. Um, that was really useful, but I just wanted to kind of kind of write it here. Um, some of my, my notes are world.active, 
is null in the editor. Um, so if you want to use world.active, you need to set that yourself. But you don't even need to use world.active. You can just create a whole new world um, the regular, regular C sharp way that we normally do and get your entity manager from it. You can set it up with whatever entity's initial state that you want. Uh, you can run an update loop on it and make sure that um, your data, all your components on those entities are what you would expect them to be. Another benefit we've had is um, we're using ECS on multiple, multiple projects. I said we had a swap match three. We also had a tap match two. Um, and, and a lot of the systems are actually pretty, pretty similar between the two. Um, hardened systems can be reused. Systems are optional. If there's an optional that one, one project um, needs that the other one doesn't, we can just remove the system and it just doesn't run anymore. We can remove the components from all the, all the entities and that data just isn't part of the game anymore. So, so if you want a new feature that has some systems, you can just put it in. Um, if you don't need that feature, you can literally just remove the system and any components associated with it. Um, one of the other things I really liked is we're learning ECS a, as a studio. Um, I've used it a couple times before, but some of the other programmers haven't. Um, so, so us all using ECS, we're all kind of learning it, using it for the first time in a production setting. And um, so it encourages knowledge transfer. I really like that. So here's some example systems between our two projects. Um, these aren't the exact names of the systems. I just kind of wanted to show where, how this code use could happen, or maybe how. Um, so we, like one, we have a swiped input system. The other one, we have a tapped input system. So those are obviously different. But some systems are literally exactly the same. Like um, our gravity system is the same between the two. Um, we actually, in one of the projects, we have a guy rewriting gravity um, to give it some additional features. And when he's done with that, if it works well, we can literally just disable the old gravity system and bring in the new one. Um, if the components are different, it's a little bit like changing API of a function. But if the components are the same, then, then we have to do no extra work at that point. You just bring it over. So I really would suggest that you try ECS. Um, I might not use it directly if you're doing a production, full on production and you don't have any experience with ECS. Um, that, that might not be the best idea, but I would definitely try it. Um, if you have a set of data that you just need to update every frame, I know in the past when I've needed to do this, I would create a game object, specifically uh, so I can get access to the mono behaviors update loop or so I could run a coroutine and we, so we have some of these game objects that's kind of littered in our scene that, that don't do anything. There's no need for a transform. The only reason why we have them is for an update loop. If you have any objects like that, I think that would be a great place to maybe write a system instead, just to process on that data. Um, I would check out Unity's examples. They have um, a GitHub page. It's great examples there. That's, that's where you'll see this code working in progress. Um, there's also the ECS and jobs forums, which is probably uh, one of the most helpful places I've been to. Um, since this is kind of a new library, um, there isn't as much documentation out for it. But one of the benefits I really like about Unity is that Unity has a great community. So, so there's other people out there, a lot of other people out there who are also using this and trying to learn it. Um, so I would suggest come, come say hello and uh, we'll, we'll learn all of it together. If you have any questions, comments, or feedbacks, this is my email address, garth.tiktokgames.com. Um, and end a little early for, for any questions. If anyone has any Q&A, we can go ahead and do that. But um, other than that, um, thank you for, for listening to this presentation. <laughs> so if you have questions, there's microphones on the sides here. And um, I'd be happy to answer any. How do, you, how do you guys deal with uh, GUI input uh, connected to ECS? Do you how, spawn components? How do you do a, deal with what? Uh, like user input. User input. So um, yes, we have, um, what we do in our game is, for, the, for these systems, we have a tapped on block component, or touch this frame component is what it is. So 
we just take the, the mouse position or touch, touch position, we round it to the nearest integer because we're on a grid-based uh, grid board. And then we have a component. Um, we store that position on an entity, entity by itself. It's like an input entity with an input component that says if, if we're touching the screen right now and what grid spot we're touching. We also, if there's a block of that spot, we'll go to that block and add a component to that block that says this block has been touched. That way we know if we, if we need to do a match, we know we need to match that block. If the block was a power up or a bomb, then, then we know, hey, we have a bomb, it has touched this frame, we need to blow up the bomb. Just because it has those two components, that system will run. And you'll even run a system that might only run on a single object? Oh, no, we definitely have systems that, that only run on a single object. Like, um, I mean, so our bomb system is actually two systems. We have a, um, one that blows up the bomb, and we have another system that just detects input and activates the bomb, right? So, so that, that first system that just detects input and activates the bomb, there's only going to be one touch at a time. Um, it's only going to be on one bomb at a time. And so the only time it ever runs is going to be on one entity. And sorry, one last question. Mm -hmm. Do you find that just having a system sitting there running um, eats up some performance? Do you ever disable the system? Um, so you, you, can, you can turn on and off systems. Um, by default, what will happen is is the ECS, if there's no, no components um, that match any, so most systems run on like a filter, right? So I, for, for example, the velocity, um, well, you need a world position or you need a velocity, right? If there's nothing, there's no velocity components, there's no world position components, the update cycle doesn't even run. It's like the system doesn't exist. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, so you were talking about multi-threading code and how that's going to be like the future of how we do everything. Yes. Um, now, how do you deal with backwards compatibility? Um, and are there any strategies that you have for profiling that stuff? Or is just more threads the better? Or, or is there a minimum use case that you have? Like, do you usually count on two threads being available? I mean, um, so, so we have a minimum, minimum spec device. Uh, I've found that most, most devices now will have multiple cores. But um, if they aren't, Unity completely handles um, time sharing on the single core itself. So um, I, I actually haven't had to worry about that right now. Unity will kind of split up the single core um, as it needs to. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I noticed you used an ignore gravity component rather than like adding a gravity component. Yeah, like everything you want. can take gravity. Uh, that's probably something we're going to do at some point. Um, we used, to have, we used to have a component like um, invulnerable to damage, but then we eventually found it made more sense to just have a I can be damaged component instead, instead of an invulnerable to damage component, because there's a lot more, we have a lot of entities that, um, you know, they track input, they, they track little pieces of data like a, a hit or, or um, input, stuff like that. So, so most entities, won't, can't take damage anyway. So it didn't really make sense to say invulnerable to damage when that's what most entities were. So yeah, we've, we've switched from invulnerability to damageable. So you'd, you'd normally suggest doing that kind of a thing rather than the negative? So, so um, when I first started working in ECS, it was kind of hard to know like, how I should make my components. That, that's probably the biggest questions when you're starting to work on ECS. I found it really depends on your systems and how you're processing your data. Um, if it makes more sense to filter out, um, like something is damageable or something can fall, then I would, I would set up your systems to work that way. Um, but if, if, it makes, if it's easier to filter out the other way, I would just do whatever is easiest for your systems, how you're going to process your data. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, when you were getting started with ECS, uh, did you have any... Uh, Thing that made it easier for you to kind of conceptually get your head into this, moving from object oriented to this data driven. Um, so this is actually probably the third third time I've I've done a, a game with ECS. Um, the first two times were personal projects, though, not really like in a production setting. But um, they definitely taught me a lot about how to, how to do this. Um, I re I'm, it's just a lot of reading. I, I don't know how to, like, breaking up your components into, like, small pieces of data, that was probably the hardest thing to do. And, and what ended up happening is the first systems we would, we would code were these big systems that did a lot of things, because we'd almost treat it like an ob a class, a manager class or something like that, right? Um, but then we, we would kind of take this big system and we'd 
be like, okay, what is it doing? It's doing step one, step two, step three, step four. And then so we would kind of make individual systems for each of those steps. And as we did that, we were able to break down our components into smaller and smaller, just very bite-sized pieces of data. Um, and that actually made it easier when we wanted to add systems or add new features later on. Um, we didn't have this giant component you know, that's meant for an orc. It's like, oh, we could just add health to something at this point. So uh, yeah, it was definitely, um, you know, I would just take a piece of data, process it every frame. If you want, really want to work on it, you're going to end up with some big systems and then, and then work on, on simplifying them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, over here. Oh, hello. How do you uh, organize your project? Do you put all your systems in one folder, or do you like feature folders, or? Um, let's see. It here. seemed like you had a lot of systems there, and, yeah. and I've worked on a couple ECS projects, but I never really got to the point where I could see that I would have a lot of systems in a full-fledged project. Yeah, we we definitely have some systems. So so we actually um, we have our ECS model uh, with all the data. Mm -hmm. um, we we kind of loosely vol. MVVM, model view, view model, if you're familiar with yeah. that. We have some other systems that all they do is announce changes to data mm -hmm. um, in the ECS, and then our view is not ECS, so it's 100% like free of ECS. So, right. um, sorry, can you say the question one more time? <laughs> just wondering how you organize your project. Like, do you uh, use feature folders, or do you put, like, do you just have one systems folder where you cram all your systems? Uh, we, we have a, probably a couple systems folders at this point. I think our view models are separated from our kind of our right. game, game processing. Um, so yeah, yeah, we, we definitely do have different folders. We, I think we're up to like 40, 50, maybe 60 systems at this point yeah. for our game, so yeah. Um, I think that's all the time we have, so I'm gonna go ahead. I'll be outside. Um, I don't know what session is next, but thank you, thank you all for joining me today. <laughs>